go to Facebook and check those. But thank you guys for joining us tonight. Uh, Paul the Apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which were at Coloss. Grace be unto you in peace from our God the Father and Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Jesus Christ and the love that we have had to all the saints and for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof we have heard before the word of truth, the gospel which is coming to you as it has into all the world. And it brings forth fruit as it does also in you since the day you heard it and you knew the grace of God in truth. In verse 7, it says, We also heard of Epreus, our dear, fair, dear, sir, fellow, fair, our dear fellow servant, who is uh, for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us uh, your love in the Spirit. For this cause also, since the day we heard it, we do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord Jesus and all pleasing, being fruitful in every work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, with all patience and long suffering, with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us sweet meat to be partakers of his inheritance of the saints of light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son Jesus. I love that. Having delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Amen. You know, a few things that we're getting into this tonight, continue is to consider. So remember that, uh, that, that really in advance of really moving forward, because tonight 14 is going to be really interesting from the standpoint of, I, I love how Paul lays these things out. And probably maybe, as we talk about tonight, probably the most vital aspect. And I don't just say that uh, just kind of as a buildup, but once you, once you hear kind of where Paul hits on this, you're going to understand just how important it was then. And you see such similarities that happen today. And when I'm talking about similarities, obviously we talked about a lot of the false doctrine that went on in there when we, we looked at that. And some, some of the things we also hit on, we hit upon, you know, some of the things contemporary false doctrine, like the Mormon church and the, uh, who else we mentioned, the Jehovah Witnesses and, and people of that, that ilk. But the unfortunate reality is some of the things that Paul is uh, addressing really kind of hit home. When I say hit home, they hit, they hit home whether you consider yourself mainline, evangelical, or like myself, Pentecostal. Some of the things that really troubled them and Paul had to reel them back on, in on are, are things that are really synonymous, not with just those fringe elements of the cult or occult, but also in some of these things that really that we kind of embrace, and it's so easy to get, get off the mark. You know, we talk about that, you know, when you're drawn away, you're drawn away by what? Your own lust and ties. So, so many times we, we associate lust with something sexual. And, and obviously that's part of the components of, of lust, but that's not the only thing. Lust is just a strong desire. It's an unnatural, it's an overbearing desire. It's, you know, you have people that have a lust for power. They have a lust for recognition. They have a lust for money and things of that nature. So it's a lust for, for recognition. They have a, a lust for affirmation. So there's a lot more than to lust than just the, the sexual nature of it. And you think about, you know, in the last days, many will depart from the faith. You know, they'll give heed to what kind of spirits? Seducing spirits. So we always can associate seduction with lust. You know, that is, that is a component of lust. You know, you're seduced by something. But you're only seduced by the things that have an appeal to you. And the things that appeal to us are those things that are inherent to our flesh. And when I say flesh, again, it's not always of a sexual nature. It can be pride. It can be jealousy, unforgiveness, wrath, and things associated with that. And so we're, we're looking at this letter that Paul wrote, and it's really a letter for the purpose of what? We talked about this. Correction, it's a correcting letter, and especially more specifically, correcting false doctrine that would cause them to kind of abandon really walking in the, in the things that, that compose really the very fabric of, 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 of our redemption. And if you think about it, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more tonight, they really what they embraced is that really a humanistic as well as legalistic means to obtain salvation. Have you ever been guilty of that? Now, think just for a second before you answer even yes or no. Think about that. Have you ever been guilty of applying a humanistic or a legalistic approach to your salvation or your redemption? See, sometimes, and I, and I hope to bring some things out that are easy, the slippery slope that we're drawn away by our own lust, these things that we do that we can have to take a step back and really do a self-examination. Paul, Paul told the church, he said, listen, examine yourself to see whether or not you be in the faith. You know, it's a little leaven that does what? Leaven's the whole lump. We allow just a little bit. It's a little foxes 
that spoil the vibe. And so if I had to ask you, what do you think the thing would be that would be able to easily captivate you? What, what would you find yourself the most easily influenced by with regard to being seduced away from genuine faith? Now think about that just for a second. It's not, it's not an easy question to answer, is it? Because if it was easy, it wouldn't be able to seduce you because you would be aware of it. But just think for just a second. I'm, I'm asking you to ponder that because I want that to kind of just be ingrained on the way you're thinking as I bring these things out tonight. What would be the thing, that the subtle thing, that, that kind of a Proverbs 14, 12, what would be that way that would seem so right to you? That seemed, that the thing would seem benign. The thing would be seem so harmless and even, even righteous. Because how did Satan come and present himself? He said he came as a what? An angel of light. And his messengers even come as angels of light. And so, you know, he didn't, he didn't come dressed in a, in a red suit with a pitchfork, did he? He came as something that would be appealing. When he even presented himself through the serpent in the garden, he was appealing to something. He said, listen, I'm, I'm not coming as this ugly creature. I'm not coming as one of those 10-foot boa constrictors that they're wrapped around their necks on, on Bourbon Street when we're out there. I mean, he didn't come like that. He came as something that was alluring. He came as something that was seductive, something that was desirable. So what are those things that we find as desirable, those things that can lure us away? Think about that just for a second as we continue. And so he clearly laid out the directives. He said, this is the purpose that I've written this letter. We went through all of those things from the purpose to the, to the people and, and, and the pastoral uh, aspects of it and his attitude towards it. We looked at that. We looked at the essential elements, really, for the uh, last three weeks, we looked at the essential element of prayer. He's saying, listen, before I even confront these things, you've got to pray, right? You've got to pray. It's the same thing when we're dealing with issues in our life. I mean, God, I've got to pray and seek you. Because unless I get my, my mind stayed upon the things of heaven, it's so easy just to excuse my own behavior if I'm not getting another set of eyes upon it. And so that's what prayer does for us. Prayer allows us to seek the face of God, to get another set of eyes on things, to, to not lean on our own understanding. We like to quote, quote the proverb, but a lot of times we don't apply the proverb by way of prayer. And so the way we lean not on our own understanding is to consider him and say, God, listen, I want to come to you. So we talked about the essential element of prayer that, that Paul uh, really brought into the equation. I'm going to correct you, but listen, I'm not correcting you without a whole lot of prayer going into it. I'm not just diving into it and just, just rebuking you on the spot and just, just laying the ax immediately to the root. I've, I've got to do some things first. Then we talked about, not last week because we had a tornado, but the week before that, we talked about really the aspect of him bringing in the, 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 the person of the Holy Spirit. Talking about the very person of the Holy Spirit and the rejection of it opens people up to false doctrine. And it's very, it's very much something that has been a, 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 a great disservice to the body, body of Christ. There's, there's whole denominations that part of their, their doctrinal statement is, I don't want to believe that the Holy Spirit's still doing the work. I mean, literally it is. Uh, we were supported uh, for, for years. As a matter of fact, we still are supported by a church. And I, and I won't even mention the, the, the denomination, but a mainline denomination that uh, supported uh, uh, Mel and I as missionaries. And like I said, they still do. But a number of years ago, they came down with, uh, uh, from their, their headquarters, from the denomination, says they could not support, churches could not support missionaries that believed and practiced the baptism of the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues. Well, that's me. Amen. I not only believe it, but I, I, I pray and speak in tongues. So they came down and said that. Well, that caused an uproar because what they found out is the big percentage of their foreign missionaries were baptized in the Holy Spirit and spoke in other tongues. Their foreign missionaries were. And so all of a sudden, all these people that had been in, within the denomination for years, they, there was an uproar. They said, so listen, you guys knew what we did over there. Like, listen, yeah, we knew you did it over there. We just didn't realize that you would tell people over here you were doing it. We were wondering how y'all were so effective. We were wondering how that you could go into a foreign country and, and have the fruit that you did. And we don't have it over here. And so this denomination, they were growing by leaps and bounds in foreign countries. Why? Because their missionaries, their ministers, their five-fold ministers were baptized in the Holy Ghost. And they could go into other countries and win people to Jesus and feel filled with the Holy Spirit with evidence of speaking in tongues. But they couldn't even do that at home. And so there was such an uproar that it, they kind of almost embraced that military thing. I can't remember which president it was under. It might have been all the way back to Clinton. Almost a don't ask, don't tell type of thing. Well, just don't ask them if they do it. And if they don't tell you, you can still support them. And so they continued to support us. They knew going in exactly this local church did. And so, you, but you see just a, 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 almost a resistance to the things of God. So Paul the Apostle was saying, listen, your biggest problem 
that there's not a check. Why? Because the Spirit of God does what? Leads and guides us into all truth. He's called the Spirit of truth. And without the presence of the Spirit of truth, there's the element and the Spirit of error that comes in. So he laid that out. And we saw that there's a need to persevere. Paul was very persevering. He was talking to them about persevering and bearing fruit. And that wasn't just a message just to the, to, to the people at large. That was a message, I believe, to, the, to their pastor. This was a, a message to those that would maybe get up in arms and just uh, throw their hands up and just have a wholesale uh, uh, lynch mob that was going after these folks. He said, you got to persevere. But today what we're going to look at, we're going to look at this one verse tonight with relationship to the issues that were discussed that really, to me, it really draws kind of a circle around the most important message that Paul the Apostle could, that could really convey to a struggling church and really that I could convey not to a struggling church, but to this church. Amen. And so I want to draw some big old circle around uh, Colossians chapter one and verse 14. If you put, if you have your Bibles at and you're taking notes, maybe you have a highlighter, highlight that verse. Because folks, listen, that was key then and it's key now. You want to stay on the straight and narrow. You want to stay focused. Because if you can get an understanding and a revelation of Colossians chapter 1 and verse 14, I tell you what, regardless, come hell, come high water, come opposition, come situation, whatever it is that confronts you, if you can understand this, I think you, you can really understand everything. So think about this. Remember, these are people who had embraced some very, very serious errors. And remember, that all these false and this really not just false, erroneous, these erroneous teaching things are just out there. But these were things that really, if you just look at it, could be considered kind of a full-scale slap in the face of really the very one that had come and died for them in Jesus Christ. They could. I mean, we, and we studied those things. I'm not going to talk to them. But yet the level of patience that I see through the apostle, the level of mercy, the level of, uh, of, of perseverance demonstrated is, is kind of, to me, not just convicting on a personal level, but challenging on a leadership level. It really is when you see his heart, you see the attitude that he had in that. And so you look at this in his introductions, and you've studied this with me for the last uh, two or three months. You know, he addresses them like friends and brethren in Christ. He calls them this. He calls them the church. He calls them the body. He calls them those that would bear forth fruit. And even though they had really kind of espoused themselves to some gross error, he still addressed them. He doesn't feel the need or the necessity to call them children of the devil. He doesn't. He didn't say, this letter, I'm writing to the church of Colossus and all you children of the devil. He didn't do that. Now, sometimes we think that would just be easy. You, you know, get this. And I see stuff like this. And, 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 you know, I think about not just where I was, but maybe who I was 25 or 30 years ago. It would have been easy for me to address letters like that. You child of the devil. Well, you know, if the same criteria, the same... The same mic, the same moat, the same plank, whatever you want to use it in Matthew chapter 7, that, that was applied to them was applied to me. I mean, I'd have probably somewhere, somebody could have picked me to pieces and called me the, the child of the devil. But so many times it's so easy to do not to persevere. And we want to minister from our position of strength into another person's position of weakness. We want to do that. And you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is, is when we're weak, he can be made strong if we understand where his strength comes from. Folks, listen, I'm, I'm a holiness preacher. I believe that. Amen. I'm, I'm a straight up holiness preacher. I, I believe in walking in righteousness. I'm, I'm a holiness preacher. I'm a Holy Ghost preacher. Amen. I, I, don't, I don't believe in walking in compromise. But there's certain people that call me the child of the devil because I got different colored lights in my church. Amen. Now, do I think that these multicolored lights make anything more spiritual? I don't. I just think they look cool. I really do. I just think they look nice. They just really make a good effect. Amen. And so I would rather have a room full of nice looking lights than a room full of these flickering overhead uh, fluorescent lights. But I got people that don't like me from that. You know, I don't like bell bottom britches. I had to wear them in the 70s when I was a kid. So when I wear pants, I like my I like to feel my calves underneath my pants. I do. You know, I got nice calves, I got thick calves, and so you know you can say, oh look, who does he think he is wearing skinny jeans? Well, when I was 300 pounds, I didn't wear them, amen? Otherwise, I'd look like a stuffed sausage, amen? But I do I think those make me any, any cooler or any holier? Any, I don't. I'm, I'm not that guy, amen? I just, I just like the way they, they feel. I like, like the way they look, you know? How about you, son? You like them too, amen? And so, really, that don't have anything. But people think I'm the child of the devil. Who's he trying to be? Look like the world. Well, if I had bell bottoms then, I'd look like the world 40 years ago. So, you know, you just can't win those battles. And so that's what I'm saying. We want to put, uh, talk from a position of strength to another person's position of weakness. And boy, I tell you what, you start doing that, 
Somebody's going to come along that can eat you alive. If you want to try it out, try me out. Amen. You want to do, I think fast enough. I'm, 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 I'm experienced enough. And if you want to eat somebody else up, I'll just play the, 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 the advocate on the other side. I wouldn't call it the devil's advocate. I'll play the advocate on the other side. And, and let's see how you come out on top of that. Because there's always somebody, amen, that's going to that's gonna big league us in another area. But I appreciate the fact that Paul the Apostle, when he addressed them, man, just the perseverance, just the, 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 the mercy, just all those things that were demonstrated to him from a leadership standpoint. And so he doesn't address them as children of the devil. He, he doesn't feel the need to call them those things or issue some proclamation about you're going to burn in hell. You know, he realized that he don't make that call. But he's telling them, listen, there's certain things that you do that can get you there. There's certain things that he wasn't there to. He was there to bring a righteous judgment, but not to bring a condemnation. That's above my pay grade. I know what will send you to hell. Now, whether or not you do those things, that's on to you. I don't, I don't have that call at the end of the day. And so he takes the approach of a loving father whose goal is to correct and to redeem them back to a right place with God. That's what his goal was. His goal. I remember standing on Bourbon Street one night. Just, and this was many, many years ago before we, before we was loading up multiple bands. It was me and probably two or three other guys that were out there. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, listen, I've sent my word to heal them. What do you send it to do? What do you send it to do? You guys have heard me say, there's certain things that I say and I say all the time. And I'm going to keep on saying because there's much of a reminder to me. There are you. It's, it's, not, uh, it, it's not our duty just to be right. It's our duty to be righteous. Why? Because the wrath of man doesn't work with the righteousness of God. My goal is not to be right. I can be right. That's anybody. I can throw you a Bible and you can read it and you're going to be right. But is that going to be righteous? Is that something that's going to really promote and provoke somebody to righteous behavior? Or is that just me going to prove them wrong? It's not, wrong. It's not hard to prove people wrong. It's not hard to prove me wrong if you try hard enough. And so the goal is always we want to bring people to a place of Back to right standing with God, back to righteousness, but that doesn't necessarily mean compromise. Matter of fact, that doesn't mean compromise at all. You know what that means? It means compassion. Folks, there's a big difference between being compromised and being compassionate. When I'm walking in compassion, I'm willing to give people space to repent. I'm willing to give people the same space that God gave and continues to give me on a regular basis to draw nearer and nearer to him. Folks, I, listen, I don't know if this is going to be headline news. I don't know if uh, Fox or CNN or whatever the big uh, news media is always going to pick up on this. But let me just say this. Confession time. I haven't arrived. I haven't arrived. And if anybody has arrived, come up here and shake my hand because I want to meet you. If you've arrived in those places. Listen, I'm still pressing. I'm still striving towards those things. Praise God that my salvation is near when I first believed. I haven't arrived. I'm in hot pursuit. I'm not where I was yesterday or the week before. I'm not stagnant, I tell you that. But I haven't arrived. There's still things, man, I'm believing. I'm trusting God for. I'm, I want to I want to pursue. I want to be changed. Man, I want to walk in a, in a level of revelation and empowerment and holiness. I want to walk in the love of God and the understanding. I don't ever want to think to myself, oh, that's good enough. Folks, because when you're good, you think you're good enough, amen. You're like that, that, that Laodicean church, amen, that, that I've stood on those grounds in, in, in modern-day Turkey and saw the stagnancy of those places that just don't flow anymore. I want to be in the flow of what God is doing in the moment, amen. And so which brings us to verse 14, Colossians 1, 14. It says, all of those things in whom we have redemption, through the blood of Jesus, even the forgiveness of our sin. Paul the Apostle was saying, listen, guys, all these things, and listen, it was horrible. The things that you're doing has violated the righteousness of God. They've, they've really been a slap in the face to him. And here's why. It's not because that you're offending me. It's not because I'm upset with you. It's not because there's some unmet expectation. He's like, listen, you're not sinning against me. You're not even sinning against one another. He said, you're sinning against the very righteousness and the love of God, which was made evident at the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago. And he said, in whom we have redemption through the blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Folks, for me, that's huge. You know why? Because, you know, I've told you the testimony of praying 25 years ago, it might have been. The Lord spoke to me and he said, Listen, would you be willing on the day of judgment only to receive as much mercy from me as you give to other people? Well, I knew the answer right then, and I know it to this very day. It hasn't diminished one bit. 
And he says, because blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. With whatever measure you measure out, it's going to be measured back unto you. And folks, I know the level of mercy that I need. Now, it, it's not, you know, and I need it. You know, have I ever been a drug addict? I never have. Have I ever been an adulterer? I never have. Have I ever been drive by as a kid? I never have. My claim to fame is obviously, I was a high school cheerleader. I was a, an ornery guy. I, that's it. But you know what? I still need a tub load of mercy. I need, as, I need as much mercy as the guy that's sitting on death row. I need as much mercy or maybe even more mercy, amen, than, than, than the guy that's violated you. I need that type of mercy. Why? Because my self-righteousness even would be called filthy rags. If somehow I thought I could do something and my redemption came anywhere except through the blood of Jesus Christ who forgives me of my sins. So I need that. And so as a person that's needy of the things of God, I appreciate that. And so it would be hard for me ever to, to ever go back to something else because if it was ever that good, why would I have left it to begin with? There's a satisfaction that can only come when we get a revelation that my redemption, my buying back, that place that I have is through Jesus Christ. So I'm grateful for him. So I don't do things because I have to do things. I did things because I couldn't do anything, and he's the one that has enabled me, amen, to do those things that he desires. And so you look at that verse in, in, in whom, he's talking obviously about Jesus, Son of God, that we have are those that would believe upon his redemption. Folks, listen, that redemption is it's a whosoever will, but it's a whosoever will call. Amen. And so the phone, he's sitting there by the proverbial phone waiting for us to call upon his name so that we, we have redemption. Or that literally means to be to bought back, to, to be released from a place of captivity. That's what it means to redeem something back. Through his blood, which obviously that was the payment that was for our redemption and for the forgiveness of sin. That is move, means re, removing any obstacle that would stand before you and man, you and God. And so you look at Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. God's hand is what? Not too short that he cannot save. His ear too heavy that he cannot hear. But what? It's your sin that has separated you from God. So the blood of, and the forgiveness of sin, what it does, it, it removes those things that would remove us from his presence. Like we go back all the way to Genesis. In the day that you eat from the tree of the knowledge of the good and evil in the midst of the, of the garden, you'll die. Amen. In other words, you'll be removed from that place. You'll be removed from that abode. You'll be removed from walking with God in the cool of the day. You'll be removed from that, that, that sweet place. But the blood of Jesus, amen, is that redeemer. It's the forgiver. Amen. It's the, the, the thing that changes everything for us. So my question for you tonight, and think about this in relationship to those two other questions that I posed to you tonight. Why do you think the, the errors of asceticism or legalism or Gnosticism were so egregious to the Apostle Paul that he had to devote a complete letter to dealing with them and bringing correction to them? Why were those things specifically so wicked, so egregious, so bad, that this whole four chapters of this letter to this church, the only letter that, that we have record of him ever writing to them, he was addressing those issues. Why do you think it was so important? Why do you think it's so important that this letter had to become a part of the canon of Scripture? Why do you think it's so important that, that we'll take weeks and months, amen, to, to, just, to just go through and comb through, amen, the revelation that he gives us by his Holy Spirit? I'm going to give you that answer, amen, if you haven't come up with it already in your mind. It's because all of those things and many of the things that we do, they essentially work to nullify the redemptive work of the cross of Calvary. Every single one of those things do. What they do is they, they minimalize what Jesus did and they maximize what we can do. Now, when I asked you the question earlier, what are those things that maybe you do that are so subtle? What are the things in your heart and life that you think that you can do to maximize, amen, uh, some type of redemptive quality in, your, in yourself that literally by doing so, you minimize what Jesus has done for you. We have redemption through the blood of Jesus. Amen. To the forgiving of our sins. In whom we have redemption. Through Jesus, through the finished work of the cross of Calvary. Folks, you know why I'm redeemed? I'm redeemed because of Jesus. Amen. That's why I'm redeemed. You know why I'm forgiven? I'm forgiven because of Jesus. You know why I'm made whole? I'm whole because of Jesus. If you want to you use those uh, terminology, you know why I'm perfect? I'm perfect because of Jesus. 
None of those things are because I jumped through enough hoops, that I joined the right organization, that I, I preach on the right street corners, amen, that I have the right t-shirt, or, or I give the right amount of, of money percentage-wise out of my paycheck. Listen, the reason that I'm redeemed, the reason I have forgiveness of sin, amen, is because of what Jesus did. Now, obviously, there's things subsequent to that, amen, that have come into my life, that, 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 that have that given me access to that place of redemption. But at the end of the day, it's not Jesus plus something else. It's Christ and Him crucified, the power of God. Paul the Apostle made it so clear. It was in 1 Corinthians 2 and 2. He said, listen, I'm determined not to know anything but Christ and Him crucified. I mean, this is the one that gave us His, his, his resume in Philippians. He talked about, listen, uh, w w with relationship to the law, what did He say? I'm pretty good at it. He said, with relationship to the law, man, I'm, I'm hitting on most points. He didn't say, he said, he said, regarding the law, he said, I am blameless. I am perfect. When it comes to the law, I think that we like to, to kind of go and look at that one moment in Paul's life. Well, yeah, but listen, he was, he was killing Christians. He did that. Well, you didn't see that until the end. And he thought that he was doing something. He thought they were violating the very law of God. We like to look at David's life and we point to that moment with Bathsheba and we want to paint that picture of him. But here's a guy that, that God said was a man after my own heart. Amen. And his response to the confrontation of Nathan really exposed that. Have mercy on me, O God. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. You desire truth in the inward part so I can know that mercy. And so just like Paul, just like a David, we're talking about people that were studying and were schooled under the law, but it had no impact or no ability to make them righteous apart from their faith in their Redeemer. I know that my Redeemer lives. Folks, listen, I'm redeemed because of Jesus. I'm made right because of the finished work of the cross of Calvary, amen? It stands alone, amen? It transcends time and through space and through culture and through nationality, through circumstance, through your family upbringing. It transcends all of those things. It changed everything, amen? From, 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 the, from the time that, uh, 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 that we could not even look back, amen, to the corridors of time and to, to the eternity in every direction, there's one event that's always going to stand out. It is the cross of Calvary, amen. There's nothing, amen, that preceded it of more, of more glory and, and, and more of a defining moment as far as the character of God. And there's never going to be another thing, amen, that's going to be able to stand, amen, that, that's going to say, listen, there's a greater work, there's a greater evidence. Even when people say that, listen, when, they, when the angels, when, uh, when Lucifer fell, he took a, he, he, the, the scripture describes it, his, his tail swiped and took a, a third of the, the stars in heaven with him. Why won't that ever happen again? Because of the cross. Because of the cross. Yet even though they had been with him, it could have been a period of eons. I don't know. The scripture doesn't put a stopwatch on those type of things. And they could have seen the glory and the majesty of the, of, of, of the, the, the Lord God of hosts. But to see the demonstration of the character of God in such a way, knowing that he didn't have to do those things, Knowing that he, that he held all power and all authority. They saw the, the, the creative nature of, of the Godhead. But God willing to come down in the form of sinful flesh and for sin. That all of those railing accusations that Lucifer may have made uh, towards him. That got a third of the angel. All of those things he could have said instantaneously when the cross of Calvary happened. They mean it nullified all of those accusations. The accuser of the brethren was cast down. You know what? He's always cast down. When the cross happened, the accuser was cast down and he will never be able to rise again in his authority, amen. He'll never be able to rise again in his accusations through eternity, amen. The testimony of Christ and him crucified is and will always be the power of God unto salvation to all that would believe. And see, it's either a testimony for you if you receive it or it's a testimony against you if you somehow deviate from that truth. Think about Galatians 3 3. Are you so foolish? Let me back up to Galatians 1 6 through 9. You know this. Paul said, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you in the grace of Christ into another gospel. You ever find yourself removed from that which called you to the grace of Christ? I mean, you think just for a minute, you know, I, I believe that, the, that, the, that there's a wholesale removal. From the grace of Christ, because for some reason, for some reason, amen. And I know what it is, it's just the deception of the adversary. We what we've done is we, we've taken the grace of God, amen, that's been revealed unto all men to do what? 
What's the purpose of grace? What does is, what is Titus 2.11 tell us? To do what? To deny ungodliness. To what? In this present time. Amen. So the power of grace, amen, is to deny all of those things that would cause us to deny him. To deny his power, to deny his authority, to deny his redemption, to re deny his enablement. So the grace of God. So how many today have used not grace, amen, as an ability to deny those things that would cause us to deny him, and have since used that freedom, I talked about it in Galatians this past weekend, using those things to sin as an occasion for the flesh. Folks, the grace of God was never meant, amen, to give us a pass uh, for sin, amen. It was the power, amen, to say no to sin. And so I'm so surprised that today in 2022, knocking on the door of 2023, that, that wholesale groups of so-called Christians, amen, have been removed from him that called us unto grace into another gospel, which is not a gospel at all. But he said, there's some that trouble you would pervert the gospel of Christ. But he said, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel than what you've heard preached, you let him be accursed. As we said before, so I say now again, if any man preach any other gospel, then what you have received, let them be accursed. And so obviously in, in, uh, in Galatians, he was dealing with Judaizers. Obviously we saw that in Colossians. He was dealing with those that wanted to come back under the law. He was dealing with the legalists. He was dealing with the, those that were more of a hum, humanistic uh, approach and, and those that were under the asceticism. And so they were trying to draw the church away from the gospel of grace through faith by re-implementing the law of Christ in addition to the work of the cross. And folks, it just does not work. And now look at Galatians 3.3. 3. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now, now made perfect by the flesh? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, now, what? Trying to make yourself perfect by the flesh. Another translation says, how foolish can you be? After you started your new lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human efforts? Folks, listen, how guilty are we of that? Listen, how did you come to Christ? What does the Scripture tell us? No man calls Christ Lord, but how? The Spirit draw them. And so the Spirit is active. The Spirit is there. The Spirit is drawing me. But we call it conviction. We call it the anointing. We call it all kinds of things. But the reason I got born again is because even where my sin abounded, God's grace, God's divine influence, amen, God's spirit drew me to that place. So you know how I got born again? I was born of the spirit. Isn't that what he told the religious man in John chapter 3, Nicodemus? He said, listen, you got to be born again. I'm not saying you got to enter back into your mother's womb. He said, you were born by the water, but now you got to be born by the spirit. And so if I got born again by the spirit, am I now going to try to do things by the flesh? Now, folks, see, that's a slippery slope for us that quote unquote do things. That literally by, means by your human effort or your sarks in the Greek. It's human effort, self will, willpower, and it, it even alludes to things that might seem respectable, even things that will create some lasting behavior modification. Things like that. Are you getting saved? Are you getting redeemed by the Spirit? Now, all of a sudden, you're going to say that you're righteous because of these things that you do through your self-will or through your willpower. And like I said this past week, I thought on Galatians 5.13, oddly enough, uh, or interesting enough, I should say, Pastor Kenny uh, up in, in Bossier City actually preached on the same verse. Interesting for that. But he says in Galatians 5.13, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. He said, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh, rather to serve one another humbly in love. So I brought up the five, five freedoms of the cross, and I'll just touch on them. Uh, freedom from the curse of the law, freedom from the obligation to sin, freedom from past decisions, freedom from wrong thinking, and the freedom to grow in Christ. And so these are the very things, the very decisions that both the Colossians, the Ephesians, the Galatians were getting robbed of. And so their effort in trying to find some more type of deeper spiritual revelation or some uh, condition, what they did is they found themselves embracing the very things that had held them in bondage before ever coming to Christ. Think about that. So Colossians 1.14, in whom we have redemption through the blood, even for the forgiveness of sin. Folks, listen, your redemption, my redemption is not found in your effort. Just tell you, your, your redemption will never be found in your effort. Have you ever tried it? 
Have you ever just strived and it's like, man, I'm going to try harder. I just, man, I, I think if I just do something a little bit more, if I could catch up and, 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 and read with the, with the speed of PT and to get through that 90 to chapter, I could do some of these tough things and maybe I get righteous. And what happens? You just get wore out. Well, because you think if I can just witness a little bit more. Listen, folks, I don't witness, amen, to somehow be redeemed. I like doing it. I don't read the word and, and, and preach and pray and, and worship. Amen. Somehow that God's going to give me some cool brownie points and I'm going to outmaneuver somebody else. I just really am just grateful. And so I'm not burned out. I'm not mully grubbing. I'm not looking for a better gig. Amen. I get to get up every single day and I'm, I'm not walking in boredom. Amen. This is just horrible. Man, I, I kind of really like who I am in Christ Jesus. I've had 38 plus years, amen, of walking faithfully towards him that I could have uh, hightailed and went the other way. But really, that's never entered in my mind. I'm not the sweetly broken pastor that feels like just giving up. And man, I just can't have how, how horrible it is. People are treating me bad. Well, that's what I bought into. You hear me? Many are the afflictions of the righteous, not because of my own righteousness, but because I've aligned myself and I've identified with Christ, the righteous one. But God delivers me out of every single one of those. Amen. Folks, my redemption is not evidenced by my absence of affliction. Amen. My redemption is evidence, amen, of my deliverance from affliction. Had I not known affliction, I'd never know deliverance. Had I never been sick, I'd never believe in healing. Amen. Had I never been weak, amen, and felt powerless, I would never have known the power of God. Every one of those obstacles I've went through has just given me an opportunity to know him so that I can make him known. Why? Because that is where my redemption is through the blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. Your efforts are merely the benefit of your redemption. That's what your efforts are. They're the benefit of your redemption. The Colossians found themselves making an effort to be better. The Galatians were making an effort to to be better. That's what they were doing. That's why they were embracing these egregious false doctrines. Somehow, it's got to be better. Why do people try to embrace something else? Typically, they want something that's going to expedite the process. That's what most people, that's why most people embrace something else. That's why these, uh, these bodybuilders embrace steroids. Why? I know that I might be able to get there naturally, but man, if I just put a needle in my arm, man, I can get there bigger. That's why other people embrace all of these things. They're trying to cut the corners. That's why these, these, these people in the financial sector begin to, to cheat and to begin to embezzle. Why? Because if I could just get there a little quicker. And folks, that's what we do. We try to find something that's a little quicker, a little bit easier. But folks, listen, it's those that will endure to the end that are going to be saved. Now, when I was in school, amen, I, I went out for the track team, made the track team. And you know what I chose to run? I chose to run the 100 meters. You know why? Because I was done in less than 15 seconds. Okay. I could fall down and be done in 15 seconds. I ran that, I ran the 200 meters. Why? Because I could be done in less than 30 seconds on a bad day. I could stroll and do that. I ran the 400 meters. Why? Because I didn't have to run all 400 meters. I just ran one of them. There was a reason I didn't join cross country. Why? Because I didn't want to run that far. I didn't want to endure. Why? Because, man, that race lasted so long by the time you finished. I didn't know who won anyway. It seemed like they was all out there forever. But, man, I tell you what, if you could place in the one, two, or four by 100 meters, man, and you hardly even broke a sweat, everybody knew you were there and you got to circle the track on your own time. Folks, that's why most people come to Christ. Amen. We want to sign up for the flash stuff. Because I can say, you know what, who won the who won the 100 meters back when we used to watch the Olympics in the 80s and 90s? Man, Carl Lewis. Well, who won the mile? I don't know. Who won the 1600? I couldn't tell you anybody's ever run the 1600. But I'm sure somebody did. I can tell you about Michael Johnson in the 200, though. Man, those guys were on there, the fastest man alive. Yeah, and they gave up quicker than anybody else. 200 meters, they were done. Run another 600 meters, see if you still win. But folks, we embrace that same type of mentality within the church. We don't want to endure to the end. And that's what opens us up to false and erroneous doctrine. Because if it ain't happening when I want it to happen, if it's not coming at my time, if I don't understand it when I need to understand it or I want to in my foot, listen, what I'm going to do, I'm going to find another way to get there. So they had merely lost sight 
of that which really had made them better, and that was the cross of Calvary. So having begun in the Spirit, they were now focused upon the best efforts of the flesh, their willpower, their abilities to somehow demonstrate some outward display of righteousness, their education, their, 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 their mental prowess, some, something of that, rather than the fruit of the Spirit in their life. Because folks, let me tell you, be real honest with you, it's easy not to drink. It's easy not to get drunk. I've been preaching on Bourbon Street, it'll be 27 years, 20 years that we came in 2023, our 20-year anniversary of coming to New Orleans. I've never gone to Bourbon Street and saw one of those guys with those big hand grenade drinks and thought, man, I wonder what that tastes like. I'd like to have a sip of that. But one time. I've never even asked Lou, Lou, what does that taste like? I don't know if Luke's ever had it. I probably think he hadn't, you know. I, I'm not interested. It's, so it's easy not to drink. Amen? It's easy not to do drugs. I've never been high one time in my life. <laughs> That's his mother. Amen. <laughs> Praise God for that. Hallelujah. I never have. You know what? And it's easy for me not to do that. It's easy for me not to use foul language. I don't accidentally. I can hit myself in the, in the, in the, in the, on the finger with a on the thumb with my thumb with a hammer. You know what? First thing I could come out of my mouth, I might say "ouch." I might probably yell "Jesus," say "Amen," or, or "How stupid was I?" But nothing. I'm not saying, "Oh man, I can't believe I." I, I don't have that tendency, so it's easy for me. Not, it's it's an, it's easy for me not to 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 engage in adultery against my wife. I have no desire to do that. It's easy for me to 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 come and worship regularly. To not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. It's not. We're, we're usually some of the first ones here and the last ones out. And I'm thinking, man, I wish somebody would get this to you. We, we were, Mel and I just come up here sometimes. We really just kind of like to hang around. What's going on? Well, I think we're just kind of here. We just kind of enjoy it. It's easy for, for, for me to read and to memorize the scripture. I enjoy that. Okay? Now, you think about some of those things. I'm righteous. But you know what? In 2004, I found out I was a diabetic. You know, from two, October 2004 until right now. I've never eaten another candy bar. Never drunk a regular soda pop. Never had a piece of birthday cake for a special occasion. Never did. Never ate no regular sugar. Never, never had. Now, initially that wasn't easy. But you know what made it easier? When they said, listen, if you don't get those diabetes out of, under control, you could go blind or you could lose your foot or your kidneys could fail you. I'm like, okay. And so it's not hard for me to avoid those things. I get offered that stuff all the time. You know what? I could sit up here and eat a big, gigantic Snickers bar, and I would not kill over. Because I've kept it under control for 20 years. Listen, I, my blood sugar might spike, but you know what? Because I'm not doing a bunch of other things. I've curbed my, 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 my weight and gotten shape. It's not going to kill me. But it's not hard for me to say no, even though I know one's not going to kill me. I just don't have the appetite for those things anymore. And so all of those things that it's easy not to do, folks, the Pharisees did those things in spades. So what are we boasting about? Am I boasting because I've never been high or I'm not cheating on my wife or I'm not drinking? I'm not boasting those things. If I'm going to boast, I'm going to boast to the Lord. Why? Because my redemption didn't come from saying no to those things. My redemption came from saying yes to Jesus Christ and saying yes to him, not just one time, amen, 35 or 40 years ago, but saying yes to the blood of Jesus every single day, amen. Saying yes, amen, when maybe my appetite wants something different. Saying yes, amen, when the enemy would try to come in and tempt me. Saying yes when he wants to draw me away by my own list. Saying yes to him every single day. Folks, that's where our victory comes from. That's where the redemption and the forgiveness of sin is. I'm staying plugged into the source. I'm not saying, well, thank you, Jesus, 35 years ago. I prayed a prayer at summer camp, and so I'm on easy street. No, I'm thinking, you know what? Every single day, Paul the Apostle said, I die to myself every single day. Every single day, that old man tries to rise up. Every single day, amen, those old appetites of the flesh come knocking on that door and seeing if I'm available for a day. Every single day, i got to slam the door in the face of opposition. Every single day, I've got to remind myself it's through the redemption, through him, amen, through the blood of Jesus, that brought forgiveness of my sin. And if any time, even as I preached numerous times, out of Hebrews chapter 2, if that word, that testimony, those things, amen, that message that was delivered to us by angels, amen, is steadfast and has received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great of a salvation? A salvation isn't about, amen, all those things that you can do and somehow outdo somebody 
but so great of a salvation that says, listen, I owed a debt that I could not pay. I owed a debt that I could not pay. And he paid that debt for me. He has taken my feet and put them on solid ground. Amen. And as long as I keep my eyes fixed upon him, he said, I'm able to keep those things that have been committed unto me. I don't commit, amen, those things, amen, to the works of the flesh. Even those things, amen, that look so nice. Even those things. I make that commitment to Christ and he is crucified. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I get to live, amen, because it's no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. And I'm not going to listen, amen, to the to the seducting spirit coming down and saying, come off the cross and now save yourself. You've already been saved. You've already been good. So you've got it on easy street. That's what they thought in Colossians. So let's find something else that's going to give us a, an easy way up. Romans chapter 8. There's no condemnation. Before I get there. Matthew 20, 23, 28, Jesus said this. Outwardly, they look like righteous people. Outwardly, listen, I can't argue, them are good people. Mormons, they're some of the nicest people you'll be around. Man, they just seem to be honorable in business, you know, honorable people. Outwardly, they look like righteous people, but inwardly, inwardly, their hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. Well, why hypocrisy? Man, they seem to be even killed. They take care of their family. They don't even drink caffeine. They're, they got all these good things going for them. Well, it's hypocrisy because they think those things are what make them righteous. And they've even rejected the very nature of Jesus, the Son of God, and somehow thought that some false prophet had trumped those things. That's the hypocrisy and the lawlessness that they've embraced, even though their outward works are so good. They're like whitewashed tombs. They look good on the outside. But inside they're dead. Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus who no longer walk after the flesh. I'm not talking about the beer-drinking flesh, the sexual and moral flesh. I'm talking about the flesh, amen, that thinks just because you check in the boxes, you're okay. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. That was the law of Moses for what that law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh. And so when we're set free by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, sets us free from the law of sin and death, that's not for the honky-tonkers. That's not for the serial adulterers. That's not for the blasphemers. That's, that's for those, amen, that outwardly they look like they were checking enough boxes. That's us at times. Whether us personally or us as a whole, as quote-unquote the professing church, for what the law could not do that was weak in the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. It's through in whom we have redemption through the blood and the forgiveness of sin. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh, even that noble stuff after the flesh, they're mindful of the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit are the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it's not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can it be, so then they that are of the flesh cannot please God. You can't stack enough good things up to please God. You can't cross enough T's and dot enough I's to please God. In verse 9, but you're not of the flesh, but you're in the Spirit if, somebody say if, the Spirit of God dwells inside of you. And look at that. We talked about that church at Colossus. They just denied even the indwelling person of the Holy Spirit. They minimalized it. Now, if any of you have not the Spirit of Christ, you're none of His. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. It's come from faith in the finished work of the cross. But the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells inside of you. He that raised Him from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by the Spirit that dwells inside of you. We have redemption through the blood, even the forgiveness of sin. So how do we overcome Lawlessness. How do we overcome sin then? Is it through resistance? Is that how you overcome sin? By just resisting sin? Is that how you overcome sin? Do you resist it? So how do you overcome sin? Oh, he played it safe. Through the, through the Spirit, since you're talking about the Spirit a lot. How do you overcome sin? Is it through saying no to it? James 4, 7 says what? Submit yourself 
therefore unto God, submit yourself, therefore unto God, then what? Then you resist the devil, and then he'll flee. Folks, listen, we don't overcome sin by some, somehow thinking that we can conjure up enough willpower. If I just go to church enough, if I just get around a lot of the holy people, if I just abandon my own friend. No, where, where I overcome those things, and where I understand the revelation, the manifestation of the redemptive power of the blood of Jesus and see the forgiveness of sin is when I submit myself unto God. What's submission? It's humility. That's literally what that word means. It means just humble yourself. I ask this question. I ask it all the time. It's a quick trick question. The interns finally just they kind of just don't know what to answer. I said, do you find yourself more humble or more prideful? I say, well, if I say humble, you'll say, man, that was awful prideful of you. If I say prideful, you'll say, you know what? He gives grace to humble, but he rejects prayer. So do you consider yourself humble? Well, you know, if you're humble, if you're submitted, right? And you're submitted by demonstration of Humility. Folks, there were some characteristics, amen, I'll tell you what, that people just don't like. Most people try to call submission agreement. Well, it seems like you're, you're submitted as long as you agree. As long as I agree, I'm submitted. The second I disagree, I ain't submitted anymore. Well, that was real humble of you. It means to make ourselves lower, to bring ourselves to a lesser state or condition. It's to put our trust above us. And so your righteousness is not found in your ability to stand your righteousness is found in your willingness to submit yourself to God through humility, and then you will set your place in right standing with Him. Having done all to stand, I stand. What do I do to stand? I put my faith in Jesus Christ. I stand with the truth that in whom the redemption comes through the blood of Jesus, through the forgiveness of my sin. I stand in that place of redemption that enables me to stand. Then I realized that the weapons of my warfare are no longer carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Why? Because back to Ephesians chapter 6, my, I'm not wrestling against flesh and blood. I'm not wrestling against these things that I can do. My battle is not with, with doing and checking all the not right boxes, but against principalities and powers, the rulers of the darkness, this age, spiritual wickedness in high places. And what do I do? I put on the testimony of Jesus. I put on, amen, faith in the finished work of the cross of Calvary. There's where my redemption comes from. There's where my forgiveness of sin comes from. Isaiah 64, 6 says, we are all infected in pure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, they're just nothing but filthy rags. Like autumn leaves, we wither and fall, and our sins sweep us away like wind. Folks, listen, your righteous deeds is self-righteousness, and there'll never be anything more the filthy rags. That's the truth. My redemption comes through the blood of Jesus, my forgiveness of sin. So folks, listen, if we're thinking, listen, man, we were cut above somebody else because, man, they get off on a tangent, so they're now the child of the devil. Folks, listen, so your, your righteousness was based upon all that or your righteousness was based upon him coming down and becoming the righteousness for us that enables us to stand. I stand because I put my faith in what Jesus Christ did. I overcome because I put my faith in what Jesus Christ did. Now, the key is, how do I appropriate that in my life? It's repentance from dead works. Not just repentance from, from dead sin, but it's any of those things that come short of the glory of God. Even my dead works of self-righteousness. That's what it is, repentance. It's that moral compunction to think differently. I don't want to think if Troy Bond does enough noble things, if Troy Bond gets enough likes for some cool quote that he puts on Facebook, that suddenly I'm righteous. No, my righteousness is always going to come through Troy Bond's faith in the finished work of the cross of Calvary. I put it anywhere else. I put it in a place of works. I put it in a place of my best efforts, my position, my, my, my title, anything like that. Folks, you know what I've done? I've come short of the glory of God. Because it's always got to be Christ and Him crucified, the power of God. That's where my forgiveness of my sin comes from. That He enables me, amen, through the power of His Holy Spirit, amen, to walk worthy of those things where I've been called. And it was for freedom that I'm called. I'm called to be free. He set me free from that law of sin and death so I can walk in the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Folks, that's what Paul was telling him. Listen, your efforts... Your Gnosticism, your great education, let me figure these things out. Let me just out-argue people. Let me just try to grandstand. Folks, listen, that didn't work. 
You're thinking if you can, you, your asceticism, or maybe if I can just beat myself up or, or move on to a mountain and, and be quiet for two years or, or somehow starve myself out, that's going to produce right. It didn't work. Or if I can just adhere to the back to the principles of the law, I can be like those, those backslidden ones that we read about in Hebrews that say somehow I can go back to that system and maybe take a little heat off of me. God, well, there's no sacrifice for those things. It didn't work. It didn't work the first time around. Otherwise, Hebrews, was it Hebrews 10? Tells us, listen, the, 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 you had to go back every single year and, and, and offer another one. Folks, listen, if you think that your righteousness is produced by your righteous deeds, folks, listen, you're just never going to catch up. My righteousness came through faith in what Jesus Christ did. I positioned myself in that place of redemption, repentance from dead works, and faith towards Him. Folks, that's not a license to sin. That's the empowerment to walk in right standing with God. That's our abilities. Amen? Amen and amen. Amen. We're not wrapping up. we got one other thing happening tonight. Amen. I mentioned the first of the service. Glad Pastor Chris and Shelly, amen, got here with their families. Folks, tonight we're going to, if you guys are joining us online, you can be a part of this too. Um, James and Clarissa, James, can you, I ain't going to make you hop up these steps, amen, with a hop of leg, but you can come up here. And, bring, and you guys, as all you family, families, moms and dads and grandparents, come up here. Tonight they asked me to say, hey, can we dedicate the baby? Pastor Chris is pastoring, so he taught tonight and rushes over here, and so we put it at the end, and so you and Shelly and Granny and aunts and uncles and all you guys, y'all come up here with them. You guys are watching say, man, these guys went Catholic. No, we don't dedicate like that. You know, this is as much for... This is as much for us as it is really for Him. That's what this comes down to, is, is us being willing to make a commitment to Him. <laughs> they, they will. Pastor Chris Shelley, y'all come up on either side of these. Pastor Thomas, you come on up here too, close by. Make way. And Mel and I are going to sneak in behind you guys. Go ahead, get your way in. You know, y'all better move out the way. There you go. Amen. This is exciting. Amen. Pastor Chris, I tell you what, Pastor Thomas, dude, first grandson, y'all did good. <laughs> y'all did real good. They did good. I keep telling everybody, but y'all got to work it out for you. They set the bar high. He's just perfect. He's beautiful. Amen. I I can't argue with it. He's just he's just awesome. Amen. And so for us, we come together and we do this. Uh, James and Clarissa, really, you guys first and foremost, it's really kind of like Hannah coming to the, the temple and say, God, listen, thank you for blessing me with, with Samuel. And I give him back to you. You know, praise God once you wean him, you don't have to leave him somewhere for some, you know, scoundrels to raise, amen. Fortunately, you get to, you get to keep hold of him, but you got a responsibility. You guys got a responsibility. But you don't just have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to you guys and to him. And, you know, I, I remember, you know, when, I dedicated you guys, you know. I teased Alyssa because I gave her a different name, Troythena, that day. The people thought that was her real name. And it may be, you know. She'll find out when the, the Book of Life is open and they don't find Alyssa in that. <laughs> but we made a commitment then. And you know what? Here, 20, 21 years later, 25 years later, 40 years later, hope now. But <laughs> I'm just teasing. 29 years later. 26? Oh, Emerson's 20. 26. You don't have a good I'm glad I don't. Anyway, we've stayed true to our commitment. We really have as parents and as grandparents and you guys as well. Stay true to your commitment. So tonight as we all gather here with grandparents and parents and aunts and uncles and friends, and just people that really just love you guys. I mean, as you come and you just publicly say, Jesus, he's yours. And so you guys are doing different than what our culture says. Our culture says, just don't, don't make them do anything. Let them make their own decisions. Well, the problem is, is Silas is perfect and as beautiful as he is. A child left it to himself will bring a mother to shame. And so your obligation is to raise him up and to teach him in the fear and the opposition of the Lord. And so we always said this with our kids growing up. You know, people would say, my kid will never do that. We weren't so brazen to say that. You know what we said? Our kids will only do what they think they can't get by with. 
And so for us, we just tried to make it seem like they couldn't get by with anything. Obviously, they did some of those things that they thought they were being slick on, but the things that were done in darkness were even revealed by the light. So for you, it's you saying, son, we're going we're gonna to throw so much light into your life through the Word of God, through fellowship, through the body, that you're, gonna, you're never going to think that those things are okay. So if you do those things, it's going to have to be an act of your own will and volition because we're going to teach you. We're going to raise you up in the fear and the eyes of this Lord. And if you train your children the way they should go when they're old, they're not going to depart from it. They're going to know. And they make, this, make decisions, but they're never going to be able to say I'm ignorant. And so for you guys, we're just praying that God will give you the wisdom and the strength to raise him. Not to raise yourself over again, but to raise him because he's who he is. He's going to need things that maybe you didn't need. He's going to, he's going to have situations that you didn't, you didn't have. And so we're going to pray that you'll, have, you'll be able to raise him for him. And God will show you his heart, the things that he's put upon his life, the call that he has upon him. And you'll cultivate those things. And it won't be because, hey, listen, this is what we want for him. But it's, God, we want your heart for our boy. Just like Hannah wanted her heart for her boy. It's like, God, this is hard. Big decisions. You may find yourself in those decisions like a Hannah one day. Say, God, as much as I would like such and such, it's just something different about that boy. We want to cultivate that. And so we're going to pray. Amen. Granddads, y'all come over here. Put your hands on that baby. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, Lord God, Father and parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, great-grandparents, Lord God, we just all gather here tonight. We're just so grateful to be a part of this, Lord God. And Father, even as this crowd of witnesses that are here that, that love him and love his family, and Lord God, Father, we pray for him. And what we pray, Lord God, is that your hand will be upon him, Lord God, that great revelation will come into his life at an early age, Lord God, that he won't have to wait to be great, Lord God. If Father is a young man, Lord God, he'll encounter your presence. There'll be a willingness, Lord God, in his home, Lord God, in his family. It'll be cultivated, Lord God, just a, an openness, Lord God, a sensitivity to the things of God, to the person of the Holy Spirit, Lord God. He'll have a, that desire and that passion, Lord God, in those things. But Lord God, all those pitfalls, that, Lord God, that are so easy to fall into, Lord God, that you'll give him a set of eyes, Lord God, that Father recognize those things in advance. You'll give him just a heart for you and a love, Lord God, for your presence and for your word and for righteousness, Lord God, that he would never want to walk in those things, that the fear of the Lord would be upon him, that this the moral dread of being displeasing unto you, Lord God, would just be evident in everything that he does. So we, Lord God, we pray for him and we pray for James and Clarissa. And we just ask that you would cause wisdom to rest mightily upon them, the spirit of wisdom and understanding. That they would recognize him, Lord God. They would recognize the things you called him to. They would lead and they would guide him, Lord God. They would direct him. They would pray for him, Lord God. That they would just, Lord God, always, Lord God, just cultivate, Lord God, the things and the call that you placed upon his life. Lord God, we bless him, Lord God. Even these grandfathers, they lay hands on him. They bless him, Lord God. They bless him like, like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Bless their children. They bless them. Let the, let the blessings, Lord God. Father, it's a great blessing, Lord God, to have men of God. Pastors, Lord God, leaders, Lord God, lay their hands, Lord God, upon their children and grandchildren, Lord God, at a young age. Bless them, Lord God, and we thank you for this in Jesus' name. And all the saints of God said, Amen. 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 Love you guys. Y'all go with God.